born in, born in Oxford, educated journalist who has already written four books while working off and on since 1970 as foreign correspondent for one of England's most prestigious newspapers, the Sunday Times. Mr. Shawcross has pu published his first book in 1970 on the rise and fall of Alexander Dubček as leader of a liberalized Czechoslovakia. This was followed in 74 by a book on Yanis Kadar, the man whom the Russians installed as ruler of Hungary after the unsuccessful uprising in 1956. Mr. Shawcross also spent 18 months in the U.S. at a moment when the Watergate crisis was coming to a boil, and out of this he collaborated with other members of the Sunday Times' Insight team to produce a, bo a book called Watergate, the Full Inside Story. From there, he shifted his theater of operations to Indochina, where he reported from Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. About four years ago, Mr. Shawcross began work on his fourth and most important book thus far, which is a critical analysis of American foreign policy toward Cambodia under President Nixon and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. He spent three years researching and interviewed hundreds of participants, and he also obtained thousands of documents uh, using the Freedom of Information Act. The result was publication last year of a book called Sideshow, Kissinger, Nixon, and the Destruction of Cambodia. Sideshow has been highly praised. Time Magazine praised its documentation. The New York Times called it a remarkable book. And Bill Moyers said it was a powerful and revealing document that cannot be ignored. In addition, just a fortnight ago, Mr. Shawcross was named winner of a George Polk Award in Journalism for his book, an, an award, incidentally, which is given uh, in name of a CBS foreign correspondent who was murdered during the Greek Civil War in 1949. But Sideshow has been criticized, too. The Wall Street Journal attacked both the book and its author for what it said were misrepresentations of facts, and Henry Kissinger himself reacted to Sideshow by altering the galley proofs of his own memoirs in order to answer Mr. Shawcross's charges that Kissinger led America's secret war against Cambodia. Mr. Shawcross has described Henry Kissinger as an astonishing phenomenon, probably the most acclaimed statesman of our times, yet Mr. Shawcross has concluded that Kissinger's achievements were surprisingly thin and that Henry Kissinger was a failure as Secretary of State. That's the topic of tonight's talk, the real Henry Kissinger. It gives me pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mr. William Shawcross. This off now. Is this, is, is this all working? Yes. Sorry, I have rather a lot of rubbish here. The biggest piece is this book. Well, this is um, an unfortunate title to this lecture, The Real Henry Kissinger, because, uh, and it's not a title I chose myself. I'm afraid they, that probably nobody really knows who the real Henry Kissinger actually is. Uh, a friend of mine, an ger American journalist called Ed Epstein, who wrote a book on, uh, recently on uh, um, Lee Harvey Oswald, rang me up a couple of days ago in New York and with a marvelous story, which I'm afraid is probably not true, but nonetheless, I'll tell you the story. <laughs> he, said, uh, he said he'd just been talking for hours, for days. He'd been interviewing. He's doing a new investigation of uh, the KGB, uh, Epstein. And he'd been interviewing a Polish defector called Galinowski, who defected in 1959 to the United States and said that he had, in his debriefing, informed the CIA 19, in 1960 that Henry Kissinger was a KGB agent. <laughs> and uh, he wanted to know why nothing had been done about it. Now, it seems to me that this is actually not such an implausible uh, notion because, in my view, Henry Kissinger has done more to damage the interests of the United States and the Western world than almost any other um, individual for a very long time, and if he was actually a cover, a, under deep cover as a KGB agent, this might be an explanation. However, whether or he is or not is another matter. The real question is the real Henry Kissinger, and again, if you're assuming this for the purposes of this argument that he's not an agent of the KGB, who then is he? Is he the Kissinger who, back in the early 70s, complained bitterly about any congressional interference in uh, the conduct of the foreign policy by the president and his national security advisor, or is he the, and who blames indeed Congress a great deal in his book for the collapse of Vietnam 
uh, the South Vietnamese government and the Cambodian government? Or is it the Henry Kissinger who nowadays uh, is urging the Congress, or at the end of last year was urging the Congress to impose restrictions upon the SALT II agreement and to uh, demand that if the SALT II agreement were passed, then the Congress be presented every year with a sort of uh, uh, behavior report, a report card on Soviet behavior by the president. That sort of interference by the Congress, King Henry Kissinger had at utterly deplored a few years beforehand. Is um, Henry Kissinger the man who, in 1968, when he was working for, Henry Rock uh, for Nelson Rockefeller, said that Nixon was unfit to be president? Or is he the man who, a few months later, scampered to Nixon's side and worked for him loyally for several years? And is Henry Kissinger the man in this telephone conversation, or is he the one in the following one, which, uh, both of which I will read to you? The first is a telephone conversation between Kissinger and Nixon. This was, uh, it's not often known, uh, realized that although Nixon was uh, constantly taping conversations, Kissinger was also doing so the whole time as well. In fact, uh, as you probably know, there was, this has been subject of a Supreme Court uh, decision recently where by the Supreme Court decided that Kissinger had in fact finessed the Freedom of Information Act, and perhaps we could talk about that briefly later, in the sense that all his documents from the, his years as Secretary of State and uh, National Security Advisor, he had removed from the State Department at the end of his tenure in January 1977 to the Library of Congress, and these had been sued for under the Freedom of Information Act by a number of reporters' groups, and the Supreme Court said no, they were no longer in the State Department and the library was exempted from the Freedom of Information Act and nobody therefore could have access to the papers, which is a very serious judgment. And amongst these papers were a lot of telephone transcripts of Kissinger's conversations. Some of them have leaked already. And one of them was a conversation that Kissinger had with Nixon. This was in 1976 after Nixon's resignation. He'd just been back to China for the second time and he'd submitted a report to Kissinger, who was still Secretary of State, and to President Ford. And Kissinger rang him up uh, in San Clemente and said, Mr. President, I want you to know that I have read your report and I find it very fascinating. Nixon, as I've said, there are a lot of things in it that are repetitive. Oh, but that too is interesting. <laughs> the, the fact that there is repetition is interesting, said Kissinger. Nixon. I'm not sure that maybe some of your other people saw it, but you could see the subtlety of the analysis I was making. Kissinger, I thought you were very, very clever. <laughs> Nixon then said, told, recounted what he had told the Chinese about Taiwan. Kissinger, I thought you were very, very good on this. Nixon then mentioned salt. Kissinger replied, I thought that was very clever. <laughs> then in the next conversation, Kissinger was on the telephone to Nelson Rockefeller. And he said, I've just read the Nixon report on his trip. He's such an egomaniac. <laughs> All he wrote was, and then Rockefeller interjected, his memoirs. <laughs> Kissinger, just what he said, just what the Chinese, nothing about what the Chinese said, practically nothing, a fascinating account of himself. I love it, said Rockefeller. Well, those are the two sides of Henry Kissinger, and I think that uh, actually they're the one and the same side. Kissinger has an astonishing talent for flattery and an, of uh, talent for obsequiousness, if you like. And it's one of the extraordinary ways in which he has endeared himself, particularly to the press corps, uh, both in the United States and in, uh, in Europe, and uh, particularly amongst British correspondents. And his success with the press is one of the main claims that he, or the main reasons he has that he's such a durable uh, figure, in my view, because I think that his record is really not such as would sustain him uh, in the, to the extent that it has, so to the extent that now Gerald Ford is talking openly of the fact that if he is nominated, he will declare that Henry Kissinger will be his Secretary of State. And in my view, it will actually be quite difficult for any Republican candidate, if elected, to avoid having Kissinger as Secretary of State. And what are the things, some of the things I would like to talk to you about tonight are the reasons why Henry Kissinger should not be Secretary of State again. And I would like to discuss with you in some detail this book of Kissinger's, uh, which has been published recently, last year, the end of last year. This is, in effect, I mean, you people in Iowa, I don't need to remind the, the, anybody here that this is a campaigning season for politicians. Well, this is Kissinger's campaign document, basically. It's Kissinger's claim 
to um, return to office as Secretary of State of the United States, and in my view, even on its just a very careful reading of this, sh will show why he has no real right to return to office whatsoever, and it's uh, because it is, in a, in a word, a very dishonest piece of self-serving apologia. Now, one, one rather more famous memoir, set of memoirs in this was the memoirs of the French foreign minister in the end of the 18th century, the Duke of Talleyrand, and his memoirs were not to be published, he said, when he died. These memoirs were to be sealed for 30 years, and in fact, they weren't published for 50 years after his death. And I think Talleyrand's uh, intention was to leave a historical document. Kissinger's intention is not to leave a historical document. It is, as I say, to assert his own right to return to office. This is not, as many of the reviewers and as the advertisements have said, a piece of our history, a, a history of our times. It is Henry Kissinger's apologia. It is an extraordinarily self-serving document. Um, and if you think of, look at just the pictures, there are 65 pictures in this book. 63 of them contain Henry Kissinger. <laughs> it's quite extraordinary. The man is such an egomaniac. The, one of the two that doesn't is a picture of his parents, and the other one, <laughs> the other one is of Cho and Lai, whom he admires very greatly, with considerable reason. But it's, uh, I mean, it's the most extraordinary self-serving document that has uh, come out for a long time, much more so than Nixon's. It's also a very dangerous document. And even serious critics like Barbara Tuckman, who reviewed it very, very critically in the New York Times book review, she clearly hated it and hated Kissinger, she nonetheless said that the book contains, quotes, virtually every message, meeting, journey, negotiation, and conversation in the 50 months it covers of the first uh, Nixon administration. And Townsend Hoops in the Washington Post in his review said, it is not only overlong, which is certainly true, but paralyzingly detailed, a setting down of nearly every meeting, mission, conversation, cable, and memcon in which Kissinger was involved. Now, that's precisely what Kissinger wants us all to think, that it is absolutely exhaustive. But it isn't exhaustive at all. It's only exhausting in, a, in every sense, not only just a whole, but in, in a, moral, an, a moral and emotional sense, and it's an exhausting book. But nonetheless, it will have, has already had, a huge impact, largely because nobody can possibly, or very few people, can read it all. And people who are naturally going to assume that it is a complete history. It isn't. I was in Thailand up until 10 days ago for a month, uh, mostly on the Cambodian border, for trying to find out what was going on in Cambodia today. Um, but while I was in Bangkok, I was asked to take part in a, sem in a seminar at the main university in Bangkok. And the seminar was called The, po the, uh, the Memoirs of Henry Kissinger. And nobody in Thailand had read the book. The book wasn't available in Thai. And the book hasn't even got there in English. And all they had that some people had managed to get hold of and read was the condensed version in Time magazine. But that, I think, is Kissinger's purpose. It's a book that is to be talked about and to be assumed to be exhaustive and to be discussed as a great work of politics and of diplomatic history. It's being compared to Machiavelli's The Prince, often in a rather cliche sense. Um, but it's it does need, I think, very rigorous examination, and I'd like to try and help you think about it. I've been trying to think about it myself and why it is a, uh, such an important and insidious book. And there are a number of things that I'd like to mention to you that Kissinger has done in this. First of all, it is only half the story of uh, the White House years. It goes from 1969 to January 1973, the signing of the Paris Peace Agreement. Now, there are several reasons for this. First of all, of course, it doubles Kissinger's royalties. The second volume presumably will be $22.50 like the first one, and which will take us up to the, uh, presumably, till um, the Jimmy Carter's election. And secondly, more importantly than that, I think, it enables Kissinger to finish off the story in the light of what people have said about the first half of it. So, for example, if Barbara Tuckman says that the book demonstrates that he's utterly inhuman, and cares nothing for the consequences of his policies on the ground in small countries which he never visits and so on, then he can produce evidence in the second volume of the tears that he has wept on numerous occasions. If Stanley Hoffman in the New York Review of Books says, as he did, 
that Kissinger was too obsessed with the balance of power and particularly with this relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States, then Kissinger can show in the second volume how Stanley Hoffman got it wrong again. And he can assert, as he has always asserted in the past, that his critics have not had adequate information, have not known all the facts. He can assert in the second volume that um, the critics of the first volume didn't know the whole story because he hadn't yet written it. And he does that throughout this book. And he continues this uh, dismissal of his critics because they don't know the whole story, as pretending once again that he is presenting the whole story here, which he does not. Now, the other thing which he does in this book, which is extraordinary, is to destroy any real sense of time or of chronology. Now, probably most of the, certainly most of the books of this complexity and of this nature that I have read uh, almost always contain literally a chronology at the back, a list, and date, a list of dates and events. Kissinger's does not, does not contain any chronology whatsoever. And the purpose, I think, is quite simply that he doesn't want people to be able to construct, or to, certainly he doesn't want to give people a precise sense of timing of events and the relation of events one to another. Because the way in which the book is constructed is deliberately done to make that as difficult as possible. For example, and what I think he, there is no real genuine narrative structure except within chapters. You have a chapter on China and then you have a, which goes say from 1969 to 1971, then you go back to 1969 again for a chapter on the Soviet Union and so on. And one thing which this enables him to do, and the fact that the book is cut in half enables him to do, is to not deal with Watergate at all. Volume one goes from 1969 to 1973, and almost all of the domestic abuses of power, which later became known as Watergate from 73 onwards, actually occurred during this time period. But Kissinger says, I will deal with this later in the second volume. And the domestic abuses of power that we know as Watergate were very firmly linked in many cases to foreign abuses of power, particularly to Cambodia. The secret bombing of Cambodia, which began in 1969, led to the first of the White House wiretaps, which was the first abuse of power for which Nixon was later indicted and had to resign. But there, there is something on the wiretaps very briefly mentioned, which he added at the last minute um, last summer, but um, Watergate as a whole and the domestic uh, abuses of power is not mentioned at all. Watergate is only referred to it throughout the book as a in somber and sort of angry terms as a deus ex machina which finally destroyed all Kissinger's grand designs and reduced in his words his triumphs to tragedy. Watergate he says uh, the brought about the, the tragedy of Watergate he says brought about the collapse of executive authority in 1973 from which all the troubles of American foreign policy not just but especially the collapse of the regimes in Saigon and Phnom Penh inevitably followed. Watergate is constantly referred to in this book as, quotes, the breakdown of our democratic processes. And that's a terrifying notion. I mean, most people, I would have thought, certainly I, and I would have thought most Americans would have thought that Watergate, in the generic sense of the word, was, in the end, the uh, functioning of the democratic processes. But Kissinger, for Kissinger, it was not. The breakdown of the democratic processes, I would have thought, was in danger of happening before 1973. The breakdown was when Nixon and Kissinger were in the White House up until 1973, busily concocting all the uh, White House horrors, to use John Mitchell's words, that later became discovered and led to Nixon's resignation. But for Kissinger, the breakdown of the dem democratic processes was the discovery of Watergate and the consequent reduction of Nixon that followed. Now, quite apart from the the, this, I'd like to return to this um, overall uh, sense of narrative which Kissinger manages to, to, to destroy in this book and the incomplete nature of the book. One of Kissinger's great successes when he was Secretary of State uh, with the press was to get the press to write about only what he was interested in, only what he wanted them to think that he was interested in particularly. The most extraordinary example of this was uh, the book called Kissinger, which was published by the Kalb brothers back in 1974. It was quite useful as a chronology of Kissinger's uh, daily life or public daily life up until that period. But it uh, referred indeed only to things in which Kissinger really had briefed the Kalbs on. By 1974, as you will remember, the story of the CIA intervention under Kissinger and Nixon's orders in Chile was pretty well documented. The Senate Intelligence Committee had not yet been uh, 
convened and had not yet published its reports. Nonetheless, there was a great deal in the press about how the CIA had helped overthrow Allende. But in the Cal book, nothing whatsoever appears on this story. Indeed, the words Allende and Chile don't appear in the index once. Kissinger had managed to convince them and managed to convince other members of the Georgetown uh, uh, journalistic set, if you like, and the diplomatic uh, press corps that such matters were not really the stuff of which foreign policy was made. And again, this book is partial in very, very much the same way. Let me give you a few examples of the way in which the sense of time is destroyed and how debilitating, if you like, and destructive that is. By any stretch of the imagination, I think you'll agree, the most pressing problems which faced Kissinger and Nixon in January 1969 when they came into office were Vietnam. Yet, in this book, you have to go from page 3 to page 226. It's 226 pages. You have to go th wade through the book until you get to the agony of Vietnam, the chapter is called. A quarter of the book, almost, is uh, well known, a fifth of the book, is devoted to other things. The first chapter, uh, the first three chapters are introducing himself and his invitation from Nixon, and I suppose that's fair enough in a sense. And then there are four chapters. First of all, on Nixon's trip to Europe, where he discusses the future of the world with the Gold and Brandt and so on, on relations with the Soviet Union, on the relationships with China, and then a long chapter on defense policy. Each of these chapters takes you from January 1969 through 1969 until the beginning of 1970 at least, then you go back, it's like going on a roller coaster, you go up and down all the time. You go back each time to January 69, and then finally, after 260 pages, you get to January 69 and Vietnam. The effect of this is actually to enable Kissinger to destroy the natural conjunction of events in a rather insidious way. Now, let me give you a couple of examples. For example, on page 739, let's go there, you have Kissinger in Pakistan. He's on his way on his secret trip to China, the first of the secret trip, trips to China. He meets uh, with Yahya Khan, General Yahya Khan, who was then the ruler of Pakistan. And he says, I, where is this? And um, he is about to fly secretly to Peking to meet Zhou Enlai and Mao for the first time. I was probably responsible for the last pleasant day Yahya had before he was overthrown as a result of the India-Pakistan war in December of that year. For Yahya was enthralled by the cops and robbers atmosphere of my enterprise. He personally reviewed each detail of my clandestine departure. He put the full facilities of his government at our disposal and lent me his trusted personal pilot. He asked nothing in return, contrary to many media claims at the time, and so on, and so on, and so on. Then, at this stage here, very little is said about Pakistan and what is actually going on in Pakistan. But you may recall that what was actually going on in Pakistan in July 1979 was an extraordinarily vicious civil war in which Yahya Khan was, in effect, his troops were murdering hundreds of thousands of Bengalis in East Pakistan. Now, to get to that stage, you have to go on from page 739, where Kissinger describes his trip to, to, uh, through Pakistan, to page uh, 853. Now, on 853, you're back now from um, July 1971. You're now back to April 1971, the beginning of this incredibly vicious civil war. And Kissinger now... Um, where are we, acknowledges uh, here, uh, what is it, 120 pages later, what had been going on three months or four months before his trip where the, he was playing cops and robbers with Yahya Khan and what was actually still going on while he was playing cops and robbers with Yahya Khan. Um, upwards of a million or two million Bengalis were being murdered. And it's that sort of removal of things from their context which is a, makes the book very deceptive in a, as I think, a, a, a dangerous way. Let me give you another example, which is something that I was I'm more concerned, interested in personally, because it's a Cambodian example. As you probably know, and as was mentioned by Mr. Emerson just now, Kissinger rewrote his book uh, substantially, the Cambodia sections of the book, at the last minute after my own book was published. Now, he's a, it was extraordinary, his, the way in which he did this, because uh, 
Uh, and it shows his recklessness in a sense, I think. He was asked constantly throughout last summer whether it was true that he had rewritten the book. And he asserted, no, no, it was not true at all. And when uh, he asserted this very categorically, and when he was uh, being interviewed by David Frost, an interview in which I uh, helped Frost, and which was a story which I can tell you about later if you want, Frost said to him, come on, we, everybody knows that you made masses of changes. And Kissinger asserted, no, that is completely untrue. I added precisely one footnote and two paragraphs. Now, the New York Times then got hold of the galleys, and it was an enormously reckless lie to tell, because publishing a book isn't a private enterprise. It's not a conversation between yourself, Nixon, and the tape recorders. It's, a, it's an enterprise involving dozens, if not hundreds, of people at the publishing house and at the printers. And the New York Times got hold of the galleys, and these are the Cambodian section of his galleys, which have um, throughout rather substantial additions and changes, certainly more than, um, more than uh, one footnote and uh, one uh, paragraph. And again, I mean, it's the sort of untruth that you, one would think that uh, you'd not actually wish to get caught out in, but Kissinger recklessly made it. Anyway, they go right through, there's dozens and dozens of changes, um, and many of them are important changes of substance, which I will come on to telling you about later, because again, I think it is, uh, they call into question his basic veracity. Now, one of the, uh, in other examples of the chronology problem, which is, happens in Cambodia, let me tell you what Kissinger has done. As you may know, uh, the invasion of Cambodia by the United States took place in April 1970, April, May 1970, a couple of months or six weeks after Prince Sihanouk, who had ruled Cambodia for 20 years through the 50s and the 60s and kept it out of the war by pursuing a policy of uh, neutrality uh, as effectively as he could between the United States and Hanoi. He was overthrown in a right-wing coup and Kissinger and Nixon immediately embraced his successors and his usurpers led by Sihanouk's Prime Minister, General Lon Nol, who wanted to bring the ca country into the war on the, Cambo on the United States side. Sihanouk was overthrown while he was in Peking um, in March 1970. Now, one of the criticisms made about uh, Kissinger and Nixon's action when, Kissinger, when Sihanouk was overthrown that was that they immediately embraced Lon Nol. They made no attempt to see if Sihanouk could get back at all and preserve the neutrality of the, of the country. Instead, they embraced Lon Nol and said, yes, bring the country into the war upon, on the side of the South Vietnamese and we will help you. And in the long run, it was an enormously destructive policy. Kissinger has always maintained that there was no way, and he asserts that in very strong te terms in the book, in which Sihanouk could be brought back. And one of the things he says in the book, on page 467, where he's dealing with um, this sequence of events, he says, in the, um, Sihanouk was ensconced in Peking, with which we had no contact of any kind at that stage. All right, and then he repeats this again on page 485, I think. Yes, Sihanouk had thrown in his lot with the communists, locating himself in Peking, then still considered the most revolutionary capital in the world, and with which, moreover, we had no means of communication whatsoever. All right, we had, with which we had no means of communication whatsoever in March 1970, this is, um, and again, with which we had no contact of any kind in March 1970. Now, we go back to the chapter on which he has written about um, the first steps to China, which uh, takes us through 1969 up until January 1970. And uh, Kissinger is describing in this chapter the subtle uh, moves that he had made throughout 1969 to try and create a, a new rapprochement, the beginnings of a rapprochement with Peking. And, uh, these moves had resulted by the end of 1969 with, in exchanges of messages, constant exchanges of messages uh, between, the United, between Washington, discreetly between Washington and um, Peking, some of them through the Pakistanis, some of them through the Romanians, and, in the, um, and culminating on January the 8th, 1970, with a meeting between their ambassadors in Warsaw. And of that, Kissinger says, in the event, the Warsaw meeting of January the 8th went extraordinarily well. The Chinese charge arrived flamboyantly at the US Embassy in a limousine flying the Chinese flag. Procedural issues were amicably settled. 
It was agreed to resume the formal and regular Warsaw meetings between ambassadors. Both sides ava avoided polemics. The Chinese accepted the principle of meeting alternately in the two embassies. The next meeting was set for January the 20th in the Chinese embassy. Thus, one year to the day after the inauguration of the president, the People's Republic of China and the United States were to engage in substantive talks again for the first time in over two years. But these were to be different from any of the 134 meetings that had preceded them. They had been painstakingly prepared over months by messages, first indirect but growing increasingly explicit, of a willingness to bring about a fundamental change in our relationship. We still had a long way to go, but we were at last in the foothills of a mountain range that it would take us another 18 minutes to, months to traverse. It was a moment of extraordinary hope. Now that's January the 8th, 1970, and then in March 1970, when it's a question of reaching Sihanouk, we had no contact with Peking whatsoever. Now, another example, one more example of this. If I've still got it. Uh, on Iran, a subject of uh, some concern now. Kissinger does much the same thing on Iran. On page 1263, he writes about Nixon's visit to the Shah of Iran in uh, May 1972. This was a crucial visit. It was a visit at which Nixon and the Shah made several deals which were secret at the time but which would have enormous consequences. One of the deals which was made at that time was for the CIA to give secret support to the Kurdish rebels against, uh, in, in Iraq, fighting against the Iraqi government. And this aid was to go through Iran to the Kurds. And it was done because the Shah requested it and because he wanted the Kurds to fight the Iraqis. And, the, and Nixon and Kissinger agreed. Later, the Shah poli Shah's policy changed, and the Kurds were cut off uh, just arbitrarily. And uh, tens of thousands of them were killed, and hundreds of thousands became refugees. This is, uh, it was a fairly dismal story, and one of which the CIA itself was very much opposed to, but Kissinger and Nixon insisted upon at that time. The other deal made at that meeting was expressed by Nixon when he got back to, the pen to Washington. The Pentagon was ordered to give the Shah everything he wants in terms of military hardware. And that was an, uh, a very remarkable uh, uh, decision. And it was one of the decisions which led to, uh, it was the decision which led over the next five or six years to $20 billion worth of arms being sold to the Shah. And which was one of the things I think which helped to sort of really destabilize Iranian society in the sense of, and certainly to increase the Shah's power in India. Way of trying to get out of it. In fact, the bureaucracy was not so reluctant to implement that one. Almost everywhere in this book, anything that goes wrong, anything that is uh, slightly uh, unfortunate is blamed on the bureaucracy, on civil servants, career civil servants in the Pentagon and the CIA and the State Department, wherever they are. Sometimes blamed upon the press and it's sometimes blamed upon Nixon. Nothing that goes wrong was ever anything to do with Henry Kissinger. It's astonishing. Anyway, Kissinger ex explains the policy on page 1264 of why we gave the, decided to give the Shah everything he wants. He says, more than 15,000 troops were still in Egypt, with which we had as yet no diplomatic relations, and which was tied to the Soviet Union by a friendship treaty signed a year earlier. Well, fair enough, perhaps, one might think. But then read on to page 1392, and you then get 1392, no, that's wrong, 1292, must be. 1292. Here we are, you see Nixon giving the Shah everything he wants because 15,000 Soviet troops are in Egypt. Now, coming on to here, um, he goes, you've, we've now gone back from May to February and March 1972. I'll switch back in time, although on in the book once more. And um, he says of this time, I told Nixon my impression, this is in March, that the Soviets were holding Sadat at arm's length, fearful of the risks of all-out support. 
a more, and a more tangible reason for my confidence was, was that in the first week of April 1972, Egypt had opened a secret channel to the White House. And he goes on and on for several pages to show how, through April, May, and June, relations between the White House and Sadat were becoming extremely cordial, though still secret. And he relates how in July, on July the 18th, 1972, just a few weeks after Nixon had given the Shah everything he wants because of 15,000 Soviet troops in uh, Egypt, Sadat actually expels all of those Soviet troops. So here's Kissinger writing in 1978, last year, saying we had to do this policy because there were 15,000 Soviet troops there. And 20, 15, 20 pages, 30 pages later, saying, uh, acknowledging, because you could hardly do anything else, that actually Soviet troops only remained for two more months. That, again, is another example of how he uses uh, the specifics of a situation in complete, to prove two completely different points. And again, I think it's very dishonest. On his treatment of Iran in general, if this is another interesting point to be made. He does, speaks of it very little indeed. And again, I think this is a question of Kissinger not really wanting to, to discuss the subject. He does, does say more about Iran than Nixon. In Nixon's book, there are just two references to Iran on pages 118 and 133. On page 118, Nixon has one sentence in his memoirs about Iran. I'll read it to you. Nearby Iran, with its enormous oil res reserves, was under the control of a left-leaning government that most observers feared would inevitably fall under Soviet domination. The second reference, he has two paragraphs, in one, one of which he says, I sensed a new inner strength in the Shah and felt that in the years ahead he would become a strong leader. Now, those are the two references in Nixon's book to Iran. And they refer to a trip that he made there in 1953. It's really astonishing that Nixon does not mention the Shah once throughout his period of office from 1969 to 1974. And although the Shah, the support for the Shah, of giving him everything he wants and building the Shah into the policeman of the Gulf was an extraordinarily important one, the effects of which, the reverberations of which, we're still obviously feeling and very strongly today. And I think that alone suggests how little one should trust in memoirs to be exhaustive and uh, to be complete histories of what actually went on. Kissinger is not much better. He does deal with Iran. He has about half a chapter on it uh, from pages 1258 to 1265 describing this trip where they decided to give Nixon, uh, to decided to give the Shah everything he wants. He deals with the Shah's decision to raise the price of oil and to be one of the most aggressive leaders in OPEC's price rises in a very sort of uh, uh, unsatisfactory way. He uh, admits that this did happen on page 1262 in a footnote. But he says, um, actually, it didn't really matter because, in fact, the real price of oil declined by 15% from 1973 to 1978, which is quite clearly an absurd justification for what actually happened. And again, he says, I will deal with the rest of our policy towards Iran and with what happened to the Kurds in my second volume. And he says, um, I'm afraid that uh, any criticism of the Kurdish situation, he says, um, up to now, have neglected to mention the excited polemics published on the Kurdish problem, have neglected to mention that they were written without any evidence of White House decisions and reasonings. I shall explain these in a second volume. Once again, he's saying, you can't criticize me because I haven't told you what the truth is or what my version of the truth is. And once again, that's really an absurd way to, uh, I mean, it uh, suggests that when the book is not to be taken uh, as, uh, as gospel. Now, I would like to, I, I hope you don't mind my going through these rather sort of nitpicking details, but I think in a book of this sort, it's only by very careful examination of the details that one can really tell whether the overall book is truthful or not. And I think that the examina close examination of the details of Kissinger's book suggests that it is actually extremely untruthful. And I'd like to talk in that, for that reason, about some of the changes that he made on the galleys of his Cambodia section. Now, once again, um, the Cambodia section of the book is very partial. He deals with the secret bombing in 1969, as you probably recall, Nixon and Kissinger decided in 1969, as soon as they came into office, to start a large-scale B-52 campaign of bombing of 
the sanctuaries along the Cambodian-Vietnamese border, which the Vietnamese communists had established through the late 1960s in order to get away from American uh, troop movements uh, attacks within South Vietnam. Lyndon Johnson had always refused requests from General Westmoreland to mount a full-scale attack on these sanctuaries. Sihanouk had tolerated their existence along his eastern border because he could do nothing else. He could not fight Vietnam, and he reckoned, and I think rightly subsequent events have proved him right, that the only way in which Cambodia could survive was by coming to some sort of uh, inglorious compromise with its huge Vietnamese neighbor. Anyway, uh, he tolerated the, the bases along the border, and he also turned a blind eye to occasional American hit-and-run attacks across the border at these bases through 1969, uh, through the late 60s under Johnson, and occasional um, tactical airstrikes at them also. Nixon and Kissinger changed this by instituting a massive B-52 campaign on a very sustained basis. One of the effects of this was to push the communist bases somewhat further into the country, not a huge distance, a few miles. And they then came into increasing conflict with Sihanouk's armed forces, with his police and with his soldiers. And this was led to increasing dissatisfaction amongst the army and particularly amongst the right-wing military leaders, especially his Minister of Defense and Prime Minister, Lan Nol. With Sihanouk, the country was no longer being kept so completely out of the war, and it was one of the reasons for his overthrow. Anyway, Kissinger discusses that policy, the, invasion, the secret bombing of 6970, in great, though very unconvincing, in my view, detail. And he discusses the invasion of 1970 in great detail, again, in an unconvincing and distorting way. And then Cambodia disappears from this book altogether. It's it is last mentioned on page, uh, the, the, the 1970 invasion is described from between pages 460, I think, and 520. That's May 1970. And then Cambodia disappears entirely from the book until page 1462 or something, when he mentions it again in two paragraphs during the Paris peace negotiations in October 72. So for two and a half years and for 900 pages, the policies which were the most destructive towards Cambodia, policies whereby the White House built up the Cambodian army from 30,000 men to 200,000 men, and insisted that this new and pathetic army, which had really no officers trained at all to lead them, march against the North Vietnamese. And uh, the time in which the bombing spread from the border areas right across the countryside, the time really when Cambodian society began to be destroyed, when the Khmer Rouge communists began to grow strong as a result of the, of the spread of the fighting and the chaos introduced, none of that is mentioned. In my view, it's because Kissinger had absolutely no concern about it, and it was indeed to him a sideshow, and he didn't realize that it was something he should deal with. No doubt he will in the second volume. But again, it shows, I think, what an incomplete and partial history this book is. Now, of the two sections that he does have, on the uh, secret bombing and on the, um, on the invasion, he made, as I said, a lot of changes and showed you at the last minute. Now, one has to be careful about this because all authors and journalists make changes on galleys, and certainly the galleys of my book looked even worse than Kissinger's at the last minute, the number of changes I made and sort of uh, to make things sound better and, you know, changes of English and grammar and so on and structure. Um, but Kissinger, I think, uh, changes were made for a different reason. They were made in response to the criticisms that I'd made in Sideshow, and they were in... Um, many ways made in a way that distorted what he had done. One of the things that I had said in the book was that uh, the secret bombing of 69 had served to push the communists further into the country. Kissinger and I had also said, said that both the secret bombing and the invasion were carried out against the advice of Melvin Laird, the Secretary of Defense, and William Rogers, the Secretary of State. Kissinger makes lots of changes to try and prove that neither of those things were true. Thus, for example, um, on the secret bombing, where are we? On the secret bombing, he has added, he asserts constantly, he's added phrases to say that there were no Cambodians in the area being bombed, which was not true. And he knows that that was not true. There are documents which I got under the Freedom of Information Act from the Pentagon listing the numbers of Cambodians in the areas being bombed. There weren't, th weren't hundreds of thousands. There were several hundred in one of the areas, and up to 1,500, I think, was the largest number in the number of the areas. 
he has on page 252 the section that I mentioned to you that he's added trying to justify the wiretaps and um, uh, that he imposed after the New York Times published the story about the secret bombing. He has um, in the invasion chapters he tries to, um, oh, and he tries to say that the secret bombing, he says two things. He says, first of all, I asked Sihanouk later uh, what happened, uh, what was the effect of the secret bombing, and he said that your bombing had no effect upon the communists whatsoever. He, Kissinger also says at the same time the secret bombing was one of the most effective operations of the entire war. And thirdly, he says that if it moved, forced the communists to move at all, then it forced them to move back into South Vietnam rather than further into Cambodia which seems to me logically extremely unlikely, that they would move from the place that they were trying to uh, take sanctuary in the first place anyhow. On the um, coup chapter, in, when he discusses the coup, one of the charges that has been made, though, do you mind if I take my coat off? Not by me, was that the CIA ran the coup against Sihanouk. Um, I don't think that was true. I think that they knew about it, but they didn't run it and mastermind it. Kissinger has added a lot of things in the coup chapter to say, um, that, uh, for example, he added a phrase, say, my reports on the coup to Nixon didn't express any particular pleasure at the coup. He has added lots of the phrases that I've already quoted to you about Sihanouk locking himself in Peking in, on page 467 um, to show that uh, the Peking, where he was uh, absolutely unobtainable and out of contact with the outside world whatsoever. There was no way in which we could get him back. He has, uh, for example, on page 468, when he, he had originally said on the galleys, Sihanouk by this stage, immediately after the coup, had identified himself with the communists. He has changed that to irrevocably joined forces with the communists, which is a significant change of emphasis. One of his main arguments about the invasion and why it was necessary for the United States to invade was that the communists, he says, had during immediately after the coup pushed themselves further into Cambodia and were about to capture all of Phnom Penh and all of Cambodia. This was not something that was asserted at the time. And Kissinger produces, it is certainly true that there was movement out of the sanctuaries further into Cambodia. The North Vietnamese did violate Cambodian neutrality more than before. But there is, it, was, it was never said that they were about to capture the whole country and run it. And that if you think about it, and you think about the trouble that the Vietnamese are now having trying to control Cambodia, it seems that it, to me that it would be very illogical and foolish of them to have done that at that time in 1970 when their priority was capturing South Vietnam. Anyway, Kissinger asserts that and he produces a lot of uh, incidents of, with Vietnamese attack upon Cambodian positions to try and prove that there was a massive war going on in April 1970, which could only be answered by an American invasion. Thus, for example, um, on page 472, he talks about uh, Cambodian, in the, in, the, um, in the original galleys, he had talked about Cambodian outposts being captured by the North Vietnamese. Now these can become Cambodian military positions. Uh, in the original galleries, these outposts had been near the, near the South Vietnamese border. The fact that they were near the South Vietnamese border has now been cut out to give the impression that this was deep inside Cambodia. On Page 473, he has added a sentence. In three short weeks after the North Vietnamese had left their sanctuaries and were seeking to isolate Phnom Penh, the US made available exactly 3,000 rifles delivered clandestinely. We gave no one, no other aid. This is in direct conflict with another ad which he made on page 474, which says by this time we had given uh, um, a great deal of support in every uh, uh, covert way that we could. On page 475, he um, has written, if, Cambodians, if the communists controlled Cambodia, Kissinger says, Vietnamization and American withdrawal would come unstuck. That's in the final version. In the previous version, it was might come unstuck. On page uh, 483, he's added a sentence to say that the North Vietnamese were by now attacking all over the country, which was not true and was not on his original galleys. On page 485, again, he's increasing, emphasizing once more the fact that Sihanouk's isolation was total, that there was no way that there could be any diplomatic solution, that China was out of touch. April saw a wave of communist attacks to overthrow the existing government structure in Cambodia. And again, that was not alleged at the time. It was a, this is an ex post facto justification which he is constructing now. On page 485, again, a new sentence, 
there, is, uh, uh, there was no serious doubt that Hanoi's unopposed conquest of Cambodia would have been the last straw for South Vietnam. On page 486, Cambodia was trying then to establish, uh, Hanoi was trying to establish its hegemony, hegemony over all of Indochina. Now, then the other question that has arisen is when did the United States take the decision to invade? American military commanders had been wanting to invade Cambodia for years. Lyndon Johnson, as I said, had refused to let them. Kissinger and Nixon agreed first to the secret bombing and now in April 1970 to the invasion. The CIA was against the invasion, Melvin Laird was against the invasion, and um, the Secretary of State William Rogers was against the invasion. Why was it done? Kissinger says it was done because of these string of North Vietnamese attacks which proved that the North Vietnamese were about to capture all of Cambodia. I said that it was done for much, many other reasons, many of which had nothing whatsoever to do with Cambodia itself. There's an extraordinary passage in Haldeman's memoirs, um, which are an interesting book to read. There's a passage in which he talks about uh, a conversation he had with Nixon right at the beginning of the administration in January 1969, and he was walking along the beach at San Clemente. And Nixon says to him, Bob, I want the Vietnamese to think, the North Vietnamese to think there's a madman in the White House with his finger on the nuclear button. That way they'll be in Paris negotiating for peace within a week. Now, it's a bizarre way of running the world. And uh, if you think about it, the trouble with it, the theory, is that to try and convince people that you're a madman, you have to do things that sane people might not do. And that's, I think, one of the reasons that Cambodia was used in the way it was used. And if, one, if the madman theory of war is a bit hyperbolic, then the, you can use Kissinger's own terms, which he underwrote the madman theory, which Kissinger used to say, the United States must behave with what he called credible irrationality. And this, <laughs> it's a, it is a bizarre phrase, but it is one that he has used frequently. Um, and I think that this is what had happened first with the secret bombing and then with the, particularly with the invasion of 1970. Nixon was in an extraordinarily emotional mood in that month. He was, and Kissinger makes this clear himself, one of the things that one can say about this book is that the portrait of Richard Nixon is very unflattering. And uh, it really sort of meets all the criticisms and underlines all the criticisms made by Nixon haters down the years and it shows him as a really weird, to say the least, personality. And Kissinger confirms that throughout April 1970, the month of the invasion, Nixon was drinking even more heavily than usual. Uh, one of the stories which I recounted in my book was how Kissinger uh, was uh, sitting in his office one evening just before the invasion, and Nixon came on the line, slurring his words rather badly, and saying, uh, Henry, I've got uh, B.B. Rebozo here. He wants a word with you. And Rebozo came on the line and said, uh, Henry, the president wants me to tell you that if this invasion doesn't work, it's your ass. And Kissinger confirms, I mean, Kissinger goes to great lengths to confirm that Nixon was indeed very drunk. He talks about a, uh, one evening that they go down the Sequoia River, the, um, they go down the Potomac River on the Sequoia, the presidential yacht, and he says it was a custom on the yacht to stand up and salute when we passed Mount Vernon. Unfortunately, uh, some members of our party were unable to stand to attention at all. And it's quite clear that the only person he's talking about from the context is Nixon himself. Nixon had also, Nixon was, you may recall, extremely angered in that month by the way in which the Supreme Court had rejected in an unprecedented way two presidential nominees for the, the Senate, I'm sorry, had rejected two presidential nominees for the Supreme Court, Hainsworth and Carswell. And Nixon was storming around the White House saying, I, these senators think that they can kick me around, but I'll show them who's tough. They think I'm going to let um, Cambodia go down the tube the way Eisenhower let Cuba go down the tube, but I'm not going to, and so on. Kissinger also confirms that um, Nixon watched the movie Patton twice during this month, uh, just before the invasion. It was a, it's, a, it's a very good movie, as you know, but it is one that uh, seemed, to, seemed to Nixon's advisor to con advisors to confirm all his more uh, 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 shall I say, uh, uh, worrying um, feelings about his own uh, individuality. And uh, William Rogers actually told Daryl Zanuck, the film's maker at that time, he said, my goodness, the president's a walking ad for your movie. <laughs> 
And um, I do think that, I mean, it's, I, I hate the idea of psychohistory, but I do think that there is a lot of evidence which Kissinger actually confirms that Nixon was very much more concerned with things other than Cambodia. He was just concerned to demonstrate toughness and resolve uh, both at home and abroad, it has to be said. At a time when American troops were being withdrawn, he wanted to establish that American power was going to stay in Indochina, and Cambodia was used for this purpose. And I don't think that the, way, the wave of attacks that Kissinger talks about and exaggerates uh, by the North Vietnamese were the prime reason for the invasion decision. And I think actually between the lines, it's quite clear that Kissinger's own case is pretty weak. So one thing is rather important. When was the decision to invade taken? Well, here we have on page 487 a paragraph by Kissinger. There had been no consideration of attacking the sanctuaries before April the 21st. All right? There had been no consideration of attacking the sanctuaries before April the 21st. And here is a memorandum that has been cut, as you can see, there's a line through it, from the galleys. And this memorandum is a memorandum that Kissinger himself had written to Nixon for a meeting, a briefing memorandum, for a meeting of the National Security Council on April the 26th. Here in the book we have, there had been no consideration of attacking the sanctuaries before April the 21st. Here at this April the 26th meeting, it says, the combined U.S. Arvin operation into the base areas has now been under preparation by MACV, that's Military Assistance Command Vietnam, for several weeks. Now, by any stretch of the imagination, several weeks is longer than it takes from back from April 26th to April 21st. And this, I think, this is a crucial piece of evidence that Kissinger has cut out at the last minute to try and prove much more strongly than he was, thought was necessary before the fact that uh, the American decision to invade was taken very much at the last minute, reluctantly, only in response to North Vietnamese aggression in Cambodia. And that there was such aggression is not, is not to be doubted, but I don't think that uh, it was the reason, the real reason for that invasion. Um, the other changes suggest that, once again, Kissinger has said, uh, uh, um, suggest that also. The, uh, for example, another thing that Kissinger does is to ignore almost completely the fact that the South Vietnamese had been attacking across the border. And this was one of the reasons why the North Vietnamese had moved further into the country to get away from South Vietnamese attacks. These attacks have been going on for, since February. Um, on page uh, 488 in the galleys, he had written, since February, the South Vietnamese had undertaken shallow cross-border operations. Now in the final book, on page 488, that has been changed, the word undertaken operations has been changed to considered operations. Um, after that, on page 488, Kissinger has um, cut out a sentence in which he talks about a visit by Alexander Haig to Saigon uh, in January 1970, in which Haig, he says, recommended limited hit-and-run raids by the South Vietnamese. Laird had encouraged General Abrahams and President Thieu to begin these raids in February. That's all gone now. That doesn't exist. Instead, it's just the South Vietnamese considering raids rather than undertaking them. Um, then another change on the timing, which is quite significant, on page 495, the um, original version in the galley said, the president had already decided on combined South Vietnamese American operations by April the 23rd. Now, in the published version, it becomes the president was beginning to lean more and more towards such operations. On page 497, he uh, talks about the charges that um, Laird and Rogers had been excluded for the decision making. And this is absolutely true. During these chaotic days in the White House, it really was Kissinger and Nixon and Bibi Rebozo and John Mitchell to a certain extent. Laird and Rogers were cut out as. And Kissinger makes clear that the bureaucracy was cut out of decision-making whenever it was thought that the bureaucracy might inf interfere with the, what I think in some cases one can certainly call the prejudices of the White House. Now, um, originally in the galleys, he says, all planning so far had been conducted without the secretaries of state and defense. Now, in the published version, that has been changed. Since the NSC meeting two days earlier, the secretaries of state and defense had not been heard from. 
Somebody, uh, when Kissinger came to give a press conference for the publication of this book in, uh, in uh, England uh, in October, the editor of the New Statesman who obtained these galleys um, held them up and said, he read Kissinger, the, these two, those two phrases, and said, Dr. Kissinger, perhaps you would tell me which of these is true. And Kissinger, was, who had lost his temper already in the press conference by being subjected to what he thought was impolite cross-examination on Cambodia, shouted, both. <laughs> Kissinger then, on page 505, has inserted a sentence. Uh, uh, Nixon, in his invasion speech, which I'm sure you remember, which is an, an extraordinary speech, talking about the United States as a pitiful, helpless giant uh, uh, abroad in a world of anarchy and disorder. He also said in his speech that up until now, that's April the 30th, 1970, the United States has scrupulously respected the neutrality of Cambodia. We've not undertaken any military operations that at all. That was untrue because of the secret bombing. Well, nobody knew it was untrue because nobody knew that the secret bombing was then taking place and, or had been taking place on that scale, and nobody was to find that out until 1973. Nevertheless, Kissinger says in his book, and this was, an, again, a last-minute edition, uh, the president added a sentence that was as irrelevant to his central thesis as it was untrue, that we had heretofore not moved against the sanctuaries, overlooking the secret bombing. That's Kissinger's sentence. He doesn't mention the fact that he himself repeated that lie then to the press that night uh, of the invasion and told the press himself in his background briefing that up until now there had been no military action in Cambodia. This was one of the things that caused the celebrated row between David Frost and Kissinger. Frost said to Kissinger, it was uh, nicely done, I think. Frost, Frost said to Kissinger, why did President Nixon in his uh, television address announcing the invasion uh, mislead the American people by saying that until now the United States had conducted no operations in Cambodia. Was that not a lie? Why did he say it, said Frost. And Kissinger said, because he is given to hyperbole. And so Frost said, well, Dr. Kissinger, in that case, why did you repeat the same lie that night in your briefing to the press? And Kissinger was furious and looked very angry, and he said, that was an incorrect statement. And then Frost went on to say, well, maybe, but it was repeated, that incorrect statement, not only in those two speeches, uh, the, uh, the, the one speech and Kissinger's background briefing, it was repeated time and time again in Nixon's report to the nation on the invasion at the end of June 1970, in Nixon's foreign policy report of February 1971, which was written by Kissinger. It was repeated in all the official sort of uh, uh, submissions of um, testimony to the Senate Armed Services Committee and the House Armed Services Committee for the next three years by the Pentagon. All the computer printouts of bombing in Cambodia showed zero. The lie basically was, went on and on through 1970, 71, 72, 73. The Congress was deceived about this um, until a member of the uh, Air Force wrote and told uh, Senator Proxima what had been going on, and then the whole thing finally came out at the time of Watergate. But um, Kissinger simply does not address that at all in the, in the issue. And uh, well, after this David Frost exchange, that, that and a number of other questions on Cambodia had driven Kissinger crazy. He stormed out of the studio and demanded that the whole thing be redone. And Kissinger, NBC executives were uh, running around him like startled chickens. They were so worried that, secretly, that the Secretary of State had been offended, and they were very angry indeed with Frost. They said that he'd been impolite and it was not the job of a journalist to be impolite. He had in conducted a debate rather than questions. He should not have answered the Secretary of State back. And it was quite clear to them that their concept of an interview with Henry Kissinger was uh, certainly not the way in which Frost had done previous interviews, notably that with Nixon, where he'd been quite tough. And that's uh, not what NBC was prepared to have with Kissinger. Anyway, Kissinger did his best to get the whole thing scrapped and the Cambodia section redone. And Frost, in the end, resigned from the project and went public and said, this is what has been happening. And as a result of that, I think NBC was under great pressure to, they did not redo it. They couldn't redo it, obviously, because Frost had resigned. And they were under considerable pressure to put out at least some of this most contentious argument on Cambodia. And one of the things that they left in, some of you may have seen it, was this particular exchange about Kissinger's lie. And he was furious and behaved in the most extraordinary way, uh, like a petulant way. He was in Europe. He'd gone to Europe after the taping in the week before it was actually broadcast. And uh, the NBC executive in that week, in the two days while the final editing was being done, 
had 35 telephone calls from Henry Kissinger, screaming abuse at him down the phone from London, saying, if this is not cut out, NBC will be ruined, and all this sort of thing. And um, one, of the, one of the NBC executives said to us later that uh, Henry Kissinger treated the neutrality of NBC in the same way as he treated the neutrality of Cambodia. <laughs> anyway. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I've talked at inordinate length about, these, about this one subject, really, about Cambodia. But I think it's important, and perhaps we can talk about other things uh, in, in, in questions and answers. I think it's important, and the reason I've dwelt on all this stuff is to show you that really this book must not be taken at face value. And when people like Gerald Ford or any other Republican candidates suggest that Henry Kissinger is the best statesman around and the only man capable of leading the United States again, it simply is not true. This Henry Kissinger is a very plausible liar, and he's also, I think, a failure as a Secretary of State. His greatest failure, obviously, was in Indochina. He started off, his policy was, he, uh, the, the notion and the policy which, as he explains it, was to defend American credibility and to protect those who had trusted in America to save them from totalitarian communism. took a, a country which had been ruined in the meantime. Just as in the book, if we hadn't intervened in 1970, the communists would have taken over five years earlier, neglecting the fact that the communists who took over in 1975 had no way of taking over in 1970. And the North Vietnamese have since invaded Cambodia to throw out those communists, the Khmer Rouge, Cambodian communists. There was, had the, Viet, had the United States not supported Cambodia, the Lan Nol government in a, an utterly futile and pathetic government in a useless war for five years, then it is possible that Sihanouk would not have come back and that uh, a, f a communist government would have been installed in Cambodia in 1970, but it would have been installed in a country which was not destroyed, whose agricultural infrastructure was still intact. It would not have been installed in a ruined country where three and a half million people had already fled as refugees, half the population, that is to the cities and the agricultural system had been destroyed by bombing and so on. By the end of 1975, Cambodian, this is, uh, by 1975, the Kissinger-Nixon policy had failed utterly and throughout the book, his blame is attached time and time again to other American institutions. The bureaucracy which was undercutting the Nixon-Kissinger plans, the press which was always being critical and the Congress which was always trying to impose restrictions. Kissinger seems to me throughout to be saying, we could have won this war, we could have done it if only everybody else had uh, seen what I was trying to do and had followed suit. What he was trying to, what he's saying in effect is, yes, this would have been possible if, if in another America, another country, another time, another place. In the America of the 1970s, it was not possible. And when you think of the strains introduced into American society by the continuation, well, first of all, by the beginning of the war through the 60s, but by the continuation of the war through the 70s, it's astonishing to think that Kissinger believes seriously today that it could or should have been continued beyond 1973 when the Congress legislated to end it, and beyond 1975. It's, I suppose, in theory possible that the United States could still today be bombing Indochina it's possible that there could be 500,000 American troops in, Ca in Indochina today still, which is, in a sense, the only logical conclusion of what Kissinger says that he wanted. But imagine what have happened, would have happened in the United States if that had happened. Kissinger divorces entirely throughout his book the reality of American society from the policies he was trying to put through. He talks about Watergate as if it had no connection whatsoever with foreign policy, and it did. It had an intimate causal relationship, which I've mentioned, and we can go into it in more detail if you want, which is, I'm sure, obvious to you. And um, it's terribly dishonest and dangerous for him to assert that the United States was the sort of place which could and should have continued that policy indefinitely. And I think that the evidence is that he has not changed at all today. He still sees things entirely in terms of the US-Soviet relationship. All other matters, whether they be internal domestic American politics and priorities, or whether they be the local concerns of countries uh, with which he is dealing, must be subordinated to that. A very recent example, 
well, there have been two recent examples. First, he said that we should have, Carter should have propped up the Shah. Well, what that would have, how that would have been done, I, nobody has ever suggested. The only way it could have been done would be perhaps by covert CIA, massive covert CIA intervention in favor of the Shah, though exactly how, I don't know, by 19, in 1978, possibly by US troop intervention, or possibly just by ordering the Shah to send his army out into the streets to destroy the mobs. But when you th if you think about the passions that are quite clearly so enormously widely felt in Iran today about the Shah, it just shows, I think, what a dreadfully and destructive and short-sighted policy that would have been. Um, the Shah was totally out of touch with um, Iranian society, and Kissinger's policy, nonetheless, is to support friends regardless of their, the nature of their rule, whether it be the Shah, whether it be Pinochet, whether it be Yahya Khan, whether it be the Greek colonels, whether it be uh, Tu or Lonnal, regardless of the position in society, if they are notionally on our side, then they have to be defended because of the ultimate test with the Soviet Union. And it's terribly destructive policy for the countries involved. And um, another example is Rhodesia. As you know, the, Rhodesian, the white Rhodesians declared independence from Britain unilaterally in 1965 and run the country since then until now, determined never to give black majority rule. In 1978, under great pressure from the guerrillas operating out of Mozambique, um, they made a sort of a, 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 a fictitious transfer of power to the blacks and they produced a black-white coalition which was an absolute, was, which was a fiction all the uh, main reins of power remained in the hands of the whites. Kissinger asserted, and there was an election which they stage managed a year ago, which was uh, uh, recognized by nobody as valid except by South Africa. Kissinger insisted last summer that we should support this interim, so-called interim government run by Bishop Mugabe and Ian Smith, and that we must give it our full support and not uh, try and do anything else. We must not allow any of the black guerrilla groups uh, into office or into the country at all. What has happened, what would have happened if we had done that or if the United States had done that would have been that the agreement which was reached by the British government finally after 14 years of dithering, 15 years of dithering, finally reached by the British government with all the parties in Rhodesia last month and which resulted in the election um, of Robert Mugabe as Prime Minister with an overwhelming majority this year, this, uh, this uh, week, would have been impossible. And when you think of the majority that Mugabe had, 80% or 85% of the population, I think it was, and 60, 50 seats out of the uh, parliament, you think of that majority, and when you think of the consequences of suppressing that, those aspirations, simply because the Soviets might read weakness into it, it is, again, a terribly short-sighted and counterproductive policy. And I would argue very, very strongly that many of the problems that Jimmy Carter found and that Vance found after from 77 onwards, problems of US credibility which remain with us today, some of them obviously induced by incompetence in this administration when you have things like the vote at the United Nations last week. Nonetheless, the real crisis of confidence in the late 1970s in the United States was not caused by Jimmy Carter. It was caused, it was the legacy of Vietnam and Watergate. And Vietnam and Watergate are intimately, Indochina and Watergate, intimately involved. And when there was this absurd division whereby Richard Nixon was the guilty man, the bad man, who was uh, stripped of all power and sent off into exile in San Clemente. And Henry Kissinger remains with us as the masterful, brilliant statesman. And it's not true. Kissinger and Nixon were as good or as bad together. They stand and they fall together. And in my view, they should not be allowed to stand, either of them. So if you have any questions, perhaps we can jump to that.